Let's get one thing straight here. This is not a Season 4 hate video. Quite the contrary, actually. I love Season 4 with all of my heart. Everyone and their pet goldfish knows the story of what was happening with Spongebob behind the scenes around this time at this point. After the completion of the first Spongebob movie, Steven Hillenburg, the show's creator, stepped down from the show as showrunner and left to pursue other projects. Coincidentally, most of the writers and storyboard artists who worked on the first three seasons of the show also left to pursue other projects. Not because they thought the show was ending. Season 3 and the movie were actually never meant to end the show. In fact, the first few episodes of Season 4 were being worked on before the first movie even released. So, I don't know how this rumor became so widespread. In his place as showrunner, Steven left his good friend Paul Tibbet in charge. Paul was one of the most major contributing writers and storyboard artists of the first three seasons. Being responsible for classics such as Sleepy Time, Frankendoodle, and Chocolate with Nuts, just to name a few. Steven was still involved with the show during the post-movie era, albeit in a very minor way as creative consultant. No one ever wants to tell you that part, though. From this video onward, I don't want to come across like I'm trying to convince people to like this season, or any other. Everyone is entitled to their own opinions, of course. I just so happen to think that a lot of the reasons why people hate everything after the first movie, especially season 4, are just kinda dumb. This retrospective just got a shit ton more interesting. Let's get on with season 4's mostly incredible 38 episode segments. Just a heads up, even though season 4 isn't my favorite of the first 4 seasons, it's the season with the most amount of 10 out of 10 episodes so far, so NO REGRETS! <laughs> Now, riddle me this, viewers at home. If season four of SpongeBob allegedly started the downfall of the series like everyone says it does, then why is its first episode peak fiction? I mean, it features Plankton, who even during this era is a fan favorite character. Fear of the Krabby Patty features one of Plankton's most stupidly complex plans to date, even including episodes after this. Plankton's plans are usually pretty straightforward, like, I'm gonna slap Krabs' ass to steal the Krabby Patty secret formula! <laughs> Yet, here, Plankton declares that the chum bucket is open for 23 hours a day. Mr. Krabs, not wanting to be upstaged, declares that the Krusty Krab is open for 24 hours a day. Of course, this results in Mr. Krabs overworking his employees to the brink of insanity. Although when Spongebob doesn't collapse, Plankton, under a new identity, makes a huge order of 10,000 Krabby Patties. This causes Spongebob to overwork himself for several weeks. After 43 days exactly, Spongebob finally snaps and hallucinates everyone as giant killer Krabby Patties. Except for this guy. Ah! I told you that shirt was hideous. Then, Plankton tricks Spongebob into going to the Chum Bucket, where he's disguised as a therapist so he can get Spongebob in this traumatized state to tell him the Krabby Patty secret formula. Do I even need to say it? 10 out of 10, number, number five, 5 on the list. Unless season 15 somehow tops this in the future, season 4 has my favorite season premiere in the show's history. This is also the last episode that C.H. Greenblatt was a writer and storyboard artist for as afterwards he would become one of the main writers and storyboard artists for shows such as The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy and Fish Hooks. And of course, he would go on to create multiple of his own cartoons, such as Chowder, Harvey Beaks, and even getting the opportunity to make his own takes on classic Hanna-Barbera characters with Jellystone. What a legend. Fear of a Krabby Patty is one of the best looking episodes of the franchise as well. Greenblatt really went out with a bang here. This one is so fast paced, so frantic, and so funny. We are in for a good-ass season here, folks. I guess you could say the Spongebob franchise is now a shell of its former self. Eh? Eh? Boo! You stink! No, I'm kidding. I have to admit, there is something in the last video that I fibbed about. In the Season 3 retrospective, I mentioned that that one would be the one where I mentioned the writers the most. Yeah, no, uh, Season 4 is. I do not envy Paul Tibbet at all, honestly. 
Imagine suddenly being thrust into this position as showrunner for one of the biggest cartoons of all time, while simultaneously having 80% of the people you worked with for years suddenly split and having to scramble to find a mostly entirely new team, all while trying to make sure the good quality of the show is kept in check. Yeah, never thought of it from that angle before, have ya? I'll keep these new and returning writer introductions brief, as to not overlap with the actual episodes too much. This time, we see the introduction of Mike Bell, who only ever wrote three episodes for season four, played a live-action fisherman a few times in the show's history, and has since written for many other cartoons, such as My Life as a Teenage Robot, some of the Paul Rudish Mickey Mouse cartoons, and even returned to the Spongebob franchise to be one of the main writers on the Spongebob spin-off Camp Coral. He also voiced the stupid fat white snail from Turbo, apparently. Very interessante. Hi, future Luke here. <laughs> um, after I already wrote the script for this segment, the season 14 episode Bassword aired, and lo and behold, uh, there's Mike Bell returning as a writer for this franchise, or the main show at least, for the first time in like nearly 20 years. I don't know if he's gonna be writing more for season 14, but that would be cool. Um, anyways, back to Shell of a Man. You know, I should probably be talking about the main fucking episode at hand right now, shouldn't I? Shell of a Man, while not being too high on my overall ranking, is still really good. Tom Kenny does a surprisingly good Clancy Brown Mr. Krabs impression, and Spongebob is incredibly puny in this ending shot. Did he get size reduction surgery so he'll imitate Mr. Krabs better? 8 out of 10, number 21 on my ranking. Mr. Krabs may be falling apart at the seams right now, but the show itself definitely isn't. Hey Patrick, what rating do you think I will give to The Lost Mattress? Ten. That, sir, is absolutely correct! Number 9 on my list, by the way. The Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward dynamic is back, and it's just as great as it always was. This time, the tenacious trio has to fetch Mr. Krabs' lost mattress from the dump, which contains all of his life savings inside of it. Despite the fact that in literally every other episode we see Mr. Krabs sleeping in a hammock, but shush. Shut up. The Lost Mattress is one of the best outings with this trio so far, even compared to its contemporaries. The jokes here are amazing. That running gag with Mr. Krabs getting moved around the hospital like a game of coma ping pong is god tier. Something else I want to point out that isn't specific to this episode, but I want to mention it here anyway, is the look of it. I'll talk about the actual animation quality of Season 4 later, but early Season 4 has this really interesting vibe to it. The colors are more desaturated than usual, the drawings feel rough but in a good way, and honestly the first few episodes of Season 4 feel like the closest they've ever gotten to recapturing that calm laid-back atmosphere that DOMINATED Season 1. The Lost Mattress is a sleeper hit in a season filled with sleeper hits. Crabs vs. Plankton brings back an old writer, Vincent Waller, who hasn't worked on the show since season 1. In fact, here's something that I've literally never heard anyone talk about before, ever. Quite a few of season 4's writers are people who have worked on the show before. In fact, they're all under a very oddly specific circumstance. Vincent Waller, Tim Hill, Chris Mitchell, and Eric Wise, all writers in this season used to be writers in Season 1 specifically, then left the show for Seasons 2 and 3, then returned as writers again in Season 4. That's part of the reason why I believe Season 4 is so strong. It has the perfect mix of both old and new talent. But again, people don't like to tell you that part. Anyways, Krabs vs. Plankton is GUILTY! of being really, really good. No, I'm not exactly what you'd call a courthouse drama buff, but my grandma really likes watching Judge Judy. Love you, grandma. Plankton should try to take legal action against Krabs more often. He was so close to getting away with it this time. If he didn't slip up at the last second, he would have won the case. This one is a 9 out of 10 and gets sentenced to number 14 on the ranking. 
Fusing SpongeBob shenanigans with the seriousness of a courthouse setting is a match made in heaven, and I honestly really hope we get another episode like this sometime in the future. If there's one thing that I believe season 4 is unrivaled in compared to every other season, it's the storytelling. For a franchise not really known for its stories, season 4 is really underrated in this regard. And if the positive reception for Have You Seen the Snail is anything to go by, more and more people are starting to realize this. I swear to god, every damn show that has a pet character in it feels like they are contractually obligated to do a pet runs away from home story. It's like the easiest thing you could possibly do with the pet character. Admittedly, I'm not as head over heels in love with this one as most other people are. I think it has some flaws in its writing. Spongebob acts uncharacteristically cruel to Gary at the start, which makes the entire conflict feel extremely forced. And even then, Spongebob has forgotten to feed Gary before, so why is this the final straw? Also not a fan of the whole, LOL, Spongebob and Gary keep passing and missing each other over and over again, heh heh, <laughs> trope. Also, also, the twist at the end where the old lady is super creepy and eats snails just kind of felt random and was only added so the climax could have some tension. Honestly, I could poke holes in this one all day, but those holes eventually get patched up with all of the good intentions. Everyone cries a river over how emotional Gary's song is, but the part that gets me personally is right afterwards, when we see all the flyers that Spongebob made for Gary, expressing how sorry he is and how much he really messed up. If there's one thing Have You Seen This Snail gets unbelievably right, it's making the stakes feel really personal for Spongebob. When they want you to care, they don't just hit you in the feels, they eviscerate them! As far as Gary episodes go, this one is pretty good. High 7 out of 10, number 24 on the list. It's rare whenever a Spongebob episode prioritizes having an emotionally powerful story over trying to make the audience laugh. I wish the show did episodes like this a little more often. Thankfully, though, the best is yet to come. Don't they know I'm- <laughs> Fuck claw machines. Fuck them. With a ten-foot pole. How do these things still pop up at every arcade when everyone knows they're one of the biggest scams on Earth? You know, alongside health insurance. Mr. Krabs really is a smart businessman after all. This thing made a name for itself by being funded by one octopus. This one is so good, guys. I have never once in my life won one of these stupid things, so I relate to Squidward here a ton. In fact, it might be one of the most relatable episodes, period. Squidward might as well be the main character of the series at this point. He always gets fan-favorite episodes. I know it's because a lot of people see him as the most relatable of the main characters, but I'm gonna be honest, Chief, that might not always be a good thing. Squidward is egotistical. He's a narcissist. He's a grouch. He's rude to most of the people he meets. If you relate to Squidward all the time, that's your problem. Luckily, Squidward's character in Skull Crane was kept in check. He gets knocked down a peg whenever he gets too gloaty and showboaty, which is nice to see. Nine claws out of ten. Number 13. On my ranking. There's a reason I had the thumbnail for this video be based off of Skill Crane. Outside of the obvious Easter egg potential, of course. Look, just play the meme so I can get on to the actual review already. Security system takes control of Squidward's house and begins attacking the city! Now that that's over with, Good Neighbors is the episode where a lot of people say that Spongebob Squarepants lost its magic and DIED, so to speak. That might be a little overdramatic, don't you think? Like I mentioned all the way back in the Season 1 video, most of the time I personally don't believe it matters whether or not a character deserves to suffer in a cartoon episode. As long as it's well written and funny, they can still be enjoyable. The issue with Good Neighbors isn't the SQUIDWORD PORN! The issue with Good Neighbors is that it's GENERIC AND MID! Yes, it's Season 4's Midword episode, ironically enough. <laughs> 5 out of 10, number 31. Usually most of the other Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward episodes have some kind of gimmick to keep them interesting. <laughs> the trio goes camping. Squidward is giant. They have to go dig up condiments in a condiment mine. 
something. Good neighbors is just SpongeBob and Patrick annoy Squidward. And also there's a good neighbor lodge, I guess. Who cares? Where's the spice? Squidward getting a security system for his house is a fun idea, but it doesn't even come into play until the third act. Cool. Fun fact, prior to the post-sequel era, this is the only episode in the entire franchise that only has one writer, and it fucking shows. Good Neighbors didn't kill Spongebob like people claim it did, but it will forever be remembered by me as Squidward's first mid-word. <laughs> Everyone shut the hell up! I'm listening to Feeling of Greed from Spongebob Season 4, Episode 5A, Selling Out. This song goes harder than a rock's boner. Selling Out does for Mr. Krabs what Squidville did for Squidward, giving a character everything they could ever want and seeing how they react. And of course, Mr. Krabs has the exact same reaction as Squidward did. He gets bored of his retirement life. He wants to be able to make something for the world, to have a purpose in his old age, and obviously make a pretty penny along the way. The commentary on what happens when businesses get bought out by mega corporations and thus slowly but surely being stripped of their soul as a result is powerful because it's real. It happens all the time. <coughs> Disney. And who else to run the soulless business into the ground but Carl Greenblatt? Yeah, sounds about right. I really like this episode's story, even if I like Squidville more just because I think that one is funnier and its message is slightly more personal to me. Still, I'm giving Selling Out an 8 out of 10 and Selling It Out to 20th place on my list. Also, hi, Zeus Service. Bro was an assistant storyboard artist in seasons 2 and 3 and worked his way up to being one of the longest running writers in the post-movie era, being paired up with Eric Wise in season 4. I'm so proud of him. Use his Twitter once. Wait a minute, I hate Twitter. F -f 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 funny The characters in this universe are simultaneously so simple yet so fleshed out that they can make an entire episode based off of the main character's laugh and they made it delightful. Yep, this usually hated episode with an independently funded laugh track is yet another one I like a lot. I think now would be a good time to bring this up, but with the exception of the post-sequel era of the show, Season 4 has my favorite animation style and characterizations for most of the cast, especially Spongebob. The animation is the most lively and expressive it's ever been up to this point. I'm assuming the show got a bump in budget after how successful the first Spongebob movie was. The colors are so vibrant they could cure blindness, the expressions are hysterically funny, and overall this feels like a prototype to what the post-sequel era would later perfect. And Spongebob himself. I mean, look at him! He's such a scrimblo bimblo now! Season 3's Spongebob wasn't too off, but it was definitely noticeable that he was a lot more of a straight man in that season, with just a hint of his childlike wonder. But they took that fun-loving whimsy that defined him in the movie and cranked it up to the max. He's so happy, so positive, so friend-shaped. I love him so much. I'm bringing this up now because Funny Pants makes an exemplary example of what I'm talking about. Anyone can hate life, most people do, but it takes a big man to laugh loud at life. What a guy. Funny Pants is a very high 8 out of 10, and I'm putting it right above the last one at number 19 on the ranking. I adore what this one says about Spongebob's character, he's genuinely such a positive influence on the world. Not to mention Funny Pants is right, the jokes here slap. Also, this one is a triple threat when it comes to new writers. Luke Brookshire, The Chad, who was previously a prop designer for old Disney cartoons, Tom King, who was previously a 3D animator for the Wiggles of all things, okay, and Stephen Banks, who was an award-winning actor, songwriter, and comedian. God damn, guys, save some of that talent for the rest of us. It just goes to show that one good laugh is worth everything in the world. You know what Spongebob needs more of? Specials that take place in different time periods. I mean, yeah, we have three of them at the moment, with Ugg, Pest of the West, and Dunces and Dragons. I think what makes Dunces and Dragons the best out of these three is how naturally all of the characters fit into their new roles. 
Squidward is the town fool who has the singing skills of a dime toucan. Mr. Krabs is the greedy tyrannical king who's ready to execute anyone at a moment's notice. Pearl is bootleg Princess Peach. Plankton is the evil wizard who's controlling the jellyfish dragon. And Acorn Lover 69 is the dark knight who gets her ass kicked by Spongebob. Everything in this special just clicks together perfectly. They get the wacky screwball Spongebob antics down pat too. From Spongebob accidentally stabbing a guy in the chest only for him to shrug it off, to Planktonomore's comedically large tower, to the random ass bowling alley that's just here, to an actually funny suicide joke, to the first of surprisingly many instances in the season of Squidward twerking, this is a truly epic and entertaining adventure throughout. And that's the key word there. Adventure. Most of the time, Spongebob episodes are pretty self-contained and small-scale. This is a cartoon with next to no continuity, after all. But when you have something like this, something that sheds its usual skin and puts an aquatic spin on a genre as old as time, that is how you know you have something truly special. 10 out of 10, number 4 on Ye Old List. Dunces and Dragons is another fan favorite from this season, and it really is one for the ages. See, ugh? This is how you represent the excitement of the time period you're portraying. Not whatever the hell you were doing. You know, it's interesting to me that Plankton is the only one of the main characters who gets bitches and nobody ever points this out. The fact that Plankton is the only one of the important characters who is married makes for some very unique stories and dynamics. So let's have our first real Plankton and Karen episode be about, oh, I don't know, Plankton dumping his wife the first chance he gets in favor of the milf of his mortal enemy, who turns out to be a huge slut. Sometimes I think that the people who have never seen this show think that we're lying about some of the chicanery it pulls. Enemy in Law is super unique for a Plankton episode. Most of it pretty much is just him trying to get with this bad bitch before she eventually cheats on him. The dollar doesn't fall very far from the tree now, does it? The episode isn't even about the Krabby Patty secret formula until the very end, which is nice. For an episode about love and romance, they sure didn't skimp out on the comedy either. Hello? I'm hanging up. Wait! 9 out of 10, number 15 on my ranking. I love this one. Mr. Krabs' mom is also voiced by a woman now for the first time. Not that there's anything wrong with males voicing female characters, and vice versa. I find it ironic how an episode about the characters making a movie came out very soon after the first Spongebob movie did. Medicine Macaroni and Bathroom Bonfire 6 The Motion Picture is not only the episode with the longest title, but the episode with the title of Funniest MM and BB episode in my opinion, as well as the funniest episode in all of Season 4. Why doesn't this one get talked about more? Seriously, this entire 11 minute movie is filled to the brim with some funny joke, charming character interaction, or just something entertaining happening on screen. And as with a lot of my favorite episodes, a ton of characters are present and almost all of them get to do something important. But let's be real here, the biggest star of this feature film is Mermaid Man himself. He must have forgotten to take his old people medicine before coming to the set because every single action he does is just... Vindication is ours! Vind How did it get up here? Perfection. And just like with any episode of any show where the characters make a movie or a show, the final product is so stylistically shitty, you'd swear it was done like that on purpose. Brian Robbins, if you're so insistent on making endless Spongebob spin-off movies until the sun explodes, then give me some of that sweet, sweet Mermaid Man movie. 100% tomato meter. Number three on my list. I always go back and forth on whether 5 or 6 is my favorite Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy episode. I'll always give a different answer depending on my mood. Oh hey, lucky, this is also Casey Alexander's first episode on the show as well, how about that? I've said it once, and I'll say it again. Rest in peace, Ernest Borgnine and Tim Conway, you beautiful bastards. Ten out of ten. Number one. Not just number one for season four, 
but number one for the entire series. This is my favorite SpongeBob SquarePants episode ever. Period. This is going to sound really weird, but Patrick SmartPants has the best story out of any SpongeBob episode. I know strong stories aren't exactly SpongeBob's shining spot, but that just makes this brilliant season 4 masterpiece all the more special. The timing of this one couldn't have been greater either, coming in at a time where we've perfectly gotten used to Patrick's stupidity and his best friendship with SpongeBob. For those unaware, Patrick SmartPants is about Patrick receiving a nasty blow to the head after falling off a cliff. This situation, which would normally be lethal for most people, causes Patrick's brain to actually start functioning, making him remarkably intelligent. Not only does Bill Fagerbaki do a voice for Smart Patrick that's smooth as butter, but this puts a huge strain on Spongebob and Patrick's friendship, with Patrick continuously denying Spongebob's requests to play childish games throughout the episode. It gets to the point where Patrick becomes so mature, he makes the tough decision to part ways with his lifelong best friend. We then get to this scene. Spongebob and Patrick, each in their own houses, lament on how much they miss each other. This scene is the main reason why this episode is at the very top for me. This isn't the only episode to focus on Spongebob and Patrick's friendship, but it is one of the only ones that feels genuine and takes the characters seriously. Being one of the only scenes in the entire franchise that actually manages to make me cry, this scene feels not only realistic, but beautiful and sincere. This is real! I've lived this before! Patrick SmartPants presents a mature message that sometimes friends outgrow each other and they have to move on with their lives despite all the good memories. But that doesn't mean that you won't make new friends or that those old memories have to go away. <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying! Sure, this one does have a happy ending as well as funny jokes throughout, but that one scene, man. That'll stick with me forever. Guys, keep your best friends close and cherish them. You never know when they might be gone. This is the season that people consider not good? The season that started the downfall of the series? This season? The season that has fear of a Krabby Patty? Dunces and Dragons, Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy 6, Patrick Smart Pants, and now this? For real? I don't care if Sandy's character is more science-centric now. If it means we get more cool-ass, high-concept sci-fi premises like this, I'm all for it. Ghost Host may have the darkest imagery of any Season 4 episode, but Squid Bob Tentacle Pants has the darkest premise. Imagine the sheer, absolute horror of being forcefully fused together with your least favorite person. That's the stuff that nightmares are made out of. With the season that prioritizes Spongebob and Patrick as a duo over Spongebob and Squidward, it feels so good to be back. Thanks, Sandra. This isn't the funniest episode ever, and if anything, I think the terrifying imagery could have been pushed a little bit further. I think the Ren and Stimpy episode did this concept a little better. But this one still fuses an 8 out of 10 rating with a number 22 spot on the ranking. And I'm just gonna come out and say it. The ending where Squidward fuses with all the other characters to create an eldritch nightmare horror abomination of nature is cool as shit. You people are all babies. We need more body horror in children's animation, and I genuinely mean that. Welcome to the Ouija Towers, where our motto is, You will die. There's a has-been hotel joke I could make here, but I'm not going to make it, so kill yourself. I've always found hotels to be really, really cool. These homes away from home have always emitted a sense of nostalgic comfort for me, as well as a weird sense of dread at the same time. Kinda like a liminal space. No, this isn't SpongeBob's version of the back rooms, but what we got is equally as entertaining. Patrick's appearance is gut-busting, of course, but Squidward's role here, finally being able to get back at Mr. Krabs for once, is definitely the highlight. Krusty Towers is a contender for the most iconic episode in all of Season 4, even if some of the reasons for that are factually false. There has been a long-running rumor surrounding this episode that this one was actually intended for Season 3, but ended up being pushed back to Season 4, hence why some folks like this one so much, because they think it was originally written for a pre-movie. This is not true. 
The sheer amount of copium one must have to be so insecure about liking a Spongebob episode made after the first movie that you have to justify liking it by saying that it was originally intended for season 3, which isn't even true in the slightest? Get real. Very high 9 out of 10. Going up on the 12th floor. For a season that barely uses Mrs. Puff or her boating school, they made sure to make the most out of it. This is definitely one of my favorite boating school episodes of the entire show, and that's thanks to the new one-off character. The new drill sergeant who takes over Mrs. Puff's class is incredibly funny and one of the show's best one-off characters ever. With a heart of ice and a voice of gravel, this strict shark steals the show. The gag routine of overly serious guy with his dick in his ass who's surrounded by a bunch of goofy idiots is a routine that's simultaneously as old as time and timeless. Mrs. Puff, You're Fired is also the boating school episode with the most amount of action so far. The climax where Spongebob basically GTAs the entire town in a matter of minutes is so blood-pumpingly exciting. This might be the first time ever where Spongebob's bad driving has actually legitimately killed people. 10 out of 10, and it's going to number 6 on the list for being a really funny episode in a season already filled with really funny episodes. I'm gonna stop this thing! Tell my wife I love her! never really think about it until it's brought up, but Spongebob characters actually do have past lives outside of this little pocket that we see them in in the show. As a series with next to no continuity and no progressing story, Spongebob can't exactly develop its characters in a point A to point B kind of way, but they can still gradually reveal things about them over time. Sandy is a character where nobody really questions her backstory or motive. She just so happens to be an anthropomorphic squirrel who lives underwater. She is literally the inverse of the fish out of water trope. She's not a fish and she's in the water, dumbass. So when Chimps Ahoy casually reveals the bombshell, or should I say nutshell, <laughs> that Sandy is actually a super genius doing research on underwater creatures who's being funded by a trio of British walking talking NFTs. Frankly, I'm beginning to question the economic benefits of NFTs. Doesn't make much sense when you get right down to it. Yeah, I'm just going to find that to be a cool reveal. This is an absolute gem of an episode that honestly feels like pre-movie and how snappy the jokes are and how character-driven the story is. Mr. Dr. Professor Patrick, my beloved. And that's two for two in terms of episodes that have really memorable one-offs. I just like how they regressed to monkey. I like a funny monkey. Monkey. Ten. Number ten. This is one of my favorite Sandy episodes ever, and it's in betwixt two seasons that barely use her. Also, So Long in Bikini Bottom clears the Texas song. Oh, looky looky, it's the bad house guest trope again. Except now with 80% more body horror and gore. The Flying Dutchman is one of my favorite secondary characters, and I honestly believe that he should be used more. I swear to god, you better not mess up the fourth movie! But stripping away all of his cool qualities just to make him a green couch potato in a literal haunted house is a really lame thing to do with him. Again, it's just the bad house guest trope, but now with a shape-shifting cunt in the mix. The whole thing of the Flying Dutchman feeling like he's not scary anymore feels so forced, too. The reason why he couldn't scare Spongebob anymore is because Spongebob got numb to it after a while, so why can't he scare anyone else? Uh, because the plot needs to happen, that's why. For as underwhelming as I think this episode is, I do really like all of the disgusting imagery it provides. <laughs> it definitely makes the episode at least a little bit memorable. This is actually the first Spongebob episode that layout artist Robert Ryan Corey contributed a lot to. All of the art that he's done for the show is mesmerizingly grotesque, and it's definitely one of the standout things from the post-movie era as a whole. Six haunted houses out of ten. Number 29 on my ranking.
After not getting a starring role in season 3, Pearl is back. She's one of the only Spongebob characters ever who has an actual canonical age, and I personally find that to be amusing. She's 16! Usually with other episodes where a character celebrates their birthday, the character's age is never specified, but this is like the one exception. Admittedly, some of the characterizations here feel really off, like Squidward would not be into a generic poppy teen boy band. Though this does lead to the second instance this season of Squidward twerking, and that's funny. That is not boys who cry! Yeah! Also, this is one of the first episodes where Mr. Krabs' cheapness actually kind of bothers me. I know I'm probably throwing stones at glass houses here, considering I said it didn't bother me in episodes like Jellyfish Hunter and even Krabby Land, but I don't know, I feel like Pearl should be the one character that Mr. Krabs doesn't cheap out on. Especially considering that it's her birthday, like come on now! Though again, at least it leads to some hysterical moments, like it's a boy! 7 out of 10, number 26 on my birthday wish list. Apparently Pearl is actually one of Steven Hillenburg's favorite characters in the series, and that definitely shows because Pearl is one of the only characters who doesn't have a single bad episode to her name. This is technically the best one so far in my opinion, but the best ones have still yet to show themselves. For the first time since season 1, we finally have another episode that focuses on KARATE! Five times out of seven, whenever an episode focuses on karate, it's usually a blast, forcing the crew to actually think about doing some well-choreographed action sequences, which was a rarity for the show up to this point. Karate Island isn't my favorite karate episode ever, but it's definitely the one that feels the most lovingly crafted. It's a homage to old martial arts movies, even going as far to purposefully getting the lip syncing wrong in some scenes to make it feel more authentic. It's quite frankly really badass. Karate Island's plot feels like it was ripped straight out of a video game. Characters get tricked into going somewhere, and X character gets kidnapped by the bad guy, so now it's up to Y character to scale the massive heaven-piercing tower, fight all the bosses along the way, reach the top, spar with the villain, and save their friend. And of course, the ultimate goal of the literal mustache-twirling villain is to get Spongebob and Sandy to invest in real estate, because of course it is! If there's anything I'm glad they subverted here, it's the bad guy's motivation. 8 out of 10, number 23 on my ranking. I mean, I like it a lot, but it's not the best episode Spongebob has ever done, you stupid rigged marketing stunt best day ever marathon! By the way, rest in peace, Pat Morita. Common ground is a phrase that I would not use to describe people's opinions on season 4. Despite getting really good reception when it first aired, the public perception on season 4 now is more split than a schizophrenic's personality. And that's because... Well, the season quite literally is split in quality. The first half of season 4 is genuinely excellent. Like, potentially the best stretch of Spongebob content we've ever gotten. And then the second half is still pretty good. What, were you expecting me to say that it sucks? What have I been saying over and over in this video up to this point? While the second half of season 4 still has some episodes that are of really high quality, there is definitely a noticeable shift in balance. What better episode to represent the split than an episode that is, in and of itself, split in quality? All That Glitters gets off to a really good start. The plot setup is unique, the emotional bits are actually effective, and the jokes are hysterical. But as soon as Spongebob buys that fucking French spatula, all the episode's previously good qualities turn sour. Like a grape rotting in the hot, dry desert sun. The story becomes generic with rude French stereotypes, the emotional beats ring hollow even after Spongebob becomes crestfallen when his old spatula abandons him, and the jokes become basically non-existent. It all feels like a generic kids movie, even down to the two main characters splitting up only for one of them to return for reasons we don't even see on screen. 5 spatulas out of 10, number 32 on the list. There's a difference between episodes that I think are mid, and episodes that I think are mixed. Mid means a lack of either good or bad qualities that are pulling me in either direction, 
whereas mixed means a perfect mixture of both good and bad qualities. All That Glitters, unfortunately, embodies all the qualities of a mixed episode. Alongside claw machines, wishing wells are some of the other biggest scams on Earth. Are you starting to notice a pattern here? Tons of episodes to choose from this very crusty crab-centric season, and my favorite one, with the exception of Fear of a Krabby Patty, is the one where most of it takes place in a deep, dark, wet hole. There's a my mom joke to be made here, and I will not make it. My mom! Alright, show, we get it. The Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward dynamic is peak fiction no matter how boring the setting is or how thin the story is. You don't have to keep waving this fact in our faces like jingling keys in front of a toddler. Nah, I'm just kidding. I love wishing you well so much. 10 out of 10, number 8 on my ranking. I really want to bring up that Down the Well, for as short as it is, is one of the most underrated songs in the show's entire history, and deserves to rub elbows with some of the other greats like the Campfire Song song. Make an extended version, you pussies! I want to imagine that this episode being about Spongebob trying to find the magic again is symbolic of something, though if I continue with this talking point any further, people are going to twist it into something obnoxiously negative. So instead, I'll say this as another opportunity to say I love Spongebob so much! Look at him trying his hardest to make everyone's wishes come true with no personal gain whatsoever. He is my son! My special little guy! I love this autistic block of cheese! Have you been enjoying how positive I've been on Season 4 so far? Surprised that I haven't called a single episode bad yet? Well, there's a first time for everything. New Leaf is bad. You can't just make an episode where a character seemingly goes through a major status quo change and expect people to fall for it. Especially in a show like this. You know, Spongebob? The cartoon that has no strong continuity or ongoing narrative? Making an episode where Plankton goes through a seemingly permanent character arc was dead on arrival. This actively ruins repeat viewings, by the way, because now that you know what the twist is, there is literally no point in getting invested in the narrative. Because the episode goes out of its way to be emotional, there are barely any memorable jokes here. And no, that does not mean I like seeing how far crabs and plankton will go to one-up each other. If anything, that just makes it worse. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, I'll send a nuke to your exact coordinates! Like wow, who would've thunk it? Plankton trying to start over and turn over a new leaf was a trick to get the sacred formula. Wow, I that's can't so unpredictable and crazy. Like, who season would've four ever thought that coming? You guys are so guys, we're Like wow, who would've thought it? Plankton trying to start over and turn over a new leaf was a trick to get the sacred formula. Wow, that's so unpredictable and 3 out of 10, number 36 on my list. The emotional bits in New Leaf are actually pretty good in a vacuum, but as a part of the whole, these feel completely empty. Nice try, but you can't pull the wool over everyone's eyes like this. This is idiotic. Dead till you're fired. You got it, Miss Kratz. Yep, the second half of season four has literally all of the episodes I dislike from this season. Go figure. I like how season 4 gave us a Gary episode so good that they then realized, oh yeah, most Gary episodes are supposed to suck, and then proceeded to shit out what is probably the most nothing episode of the entire season. I like how Patrick somehow makes up this random ass disease on the spot for no reason whatsoever. I like how Squidward believes him for some reason, even though he has no reason to. I like how the actually cool zombie apocalypse stuff lasts for only one scene. I like... Okay, I actually really like this frame, unironically. Sure, okay, I get it. Haha, ha, this episode is supposed to be a commentary on mass hysteria and how quickly it can spiral out of control. But like, why is everyone acting like zombies if the disease is fake? Are they stupid? Yes. 4 out of 10, right above the last one. Once Bitten is the first episode to feature the show's newscaster character, Perch Perkins, and that's neat at least. The newscaster character in the pre-movie era I assume was just a prototype, not counting the realistic fish head. But this is honestly a pathetic excuse for a zombie apocalypse episode. Krabby Patty Creature Feature Sweep! Hey, I know 
just the thing to get the old spirits up. I need 20 Krabby Patties, please. Sure thing, old buddy old squid. Did you know that coming up with this whole bit was what got new writer Danny Michaeli hired on the show? And that's very well deserved, too, because this is the best scene in the whole episode. No disrespect to the rest of Bummer Vacation. In fact, I actually really like this one. Mr. Krabs is forced to give SpongeBob a vacation from work so he doesn't get fined. But since working at the Krusty Krab is SpongeBob's favorite thing ever, he physically can't stay away and eventually tries forcing his way back in. That's pretty much it as far as a premise goes. This is another one of those gag-driven episodes where as soon as they finish setting up the conflict, they knock down all possible joke opportunities like a row of dominoes. Add in a pinch of meme-worthy moments and a dash of insanity as the secret ingredient, and you have concocted one of the most classic-feeling SpongeBob episodes ever. 9 out of 10, number 18 on the ranking. Most of the time, SpongeBob's workaholic nature is seen as a good thing in the eyes of the show, but I actually like how they flip the script here for once, with said workaholic nature coming back to bite him. Sad he never got the vacation he deserves, though. No matter how hard you work, you gotta take a break once in a while. Not me, though! I still have over a quarter of the season left. Whoopee! If people didn't burn me at the stake for liking episodes such as Funny Pants and Squid Bob Tentacle Pants, then this'll probably be the final straw. Actually, Tenna, you are out of straws. Guys, Wigstruck is basically just a better version of Grandma's Kisses. Both episodes involve the town making fun of Spongebob for some asinine reason, but instead of letting it get to him and creating a really forced and uncomfortable conflict like it did in Grandma's Kisses, this time Spongebob is completely oblivious to the fact that he's being made fun of here, mistaking the town's condescending jokes as compliments. Not only do I think this is a better fit for Spongebob's character, but it lets them create situations that allow for just... S-tier dialogue humor. You wouldn't know cool if I locked you in the freezer. <laughs> For your information, Mr. Krabs, Squidward has locked me in the freezer, so I think I know what cool is. Just another reminder that roasting humor is peak humor. I also like how there's a commentary here about people who are ahead of the times in terms of fashion culture, but end up getting snuffed out because they weren't on the trend at the exact same time as everyone else. This doesn't even apply to fashion, by the way. This could apply to literally any trend. Seven wigs out of ten, number 25 on the list. Ned and the Needlefish need to get their own episode, by the way. The fact that they've only appeared in two episodes across the entire franchise is criminal. Not my favorite episode of a Nicktoon to focus on hair, but not my least favorite either. I don't care how many times I see it, I don't care how much it's overdone. I worship the Fantastic Voyage trope, especially in animation. These inside stories allow for the animators and artists to get as wacky, weird, creative, and off the wall as physically possible with both the visuals and scenarios. You can't prove that this isn't what the insides of an anthropomorphic octopus look like. Have you ever even been inside of an anthropomorphic octopus? Don't answer that. Squidtastic Voyage is basically what would happen if Sandy's rocket wasn't shit. The characters actually get to go on their adventure for starters, that's pretty important. Sandy is heavily involved with the story this time too, that's another plus. Squidward actually gets several opportunities to bounce off of Sandy, which is a rare but welcome dynamic for the show. You're not in control of your actions! The story is fun, the jokes are great, and the sci-fi elements are front and center as they should be. Sure, this one doesn't really do too much to stand out compared to all the other Fantastic Voyage stories that exist out there. In fact, one of the spin-offs from this show would end up outclassing it, but it's still really amazing at what it does. 10 out of 10, number 7 on my ranking. No, I'm not exactly into vor or inflation, but this journey to the center of Squidward is a great time. Sad to know that I'm probably one of the only people who likes this one for completely normal reasons. Uh, I kinda want to skip this one, I'm not even going to lie. For as much as I like this one a lot, it didn't exactly age too well in terms of the LGBT community. 
I still think the jokes on display here are extremely entertaining, which is why I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 and putting it at number 17 on my list. But... The way Squidward and Mr. Krabs hit on Patrick border on sexual harassment and the transgender allegory being boiled down to, people will find you more attractive. I mean, yeah. It's not the crew's fault, of course. Times were different back then. But this is not the type of episode that could be made today, and I seriously want to move on to the next one to avoid steering this video in a political direction. Thank you for understanding. <sighs> well, I'd rather talk about an awful episode rather than a politically charged one. Do you ever have those pieces of media that you just absolutely hate? Like, loathe with every fiber of your being and every fiber of your doing? Yet, you just can't pinpoint a main reason as to why? Because that's me with the thing. There are, of course, things. <laughs> I can point to and say that I hate. The premise is basically just a worse version of jellyfishing in every single way possible. Most of the attempts at humor are consistently not funny at all. This is Kelpie G's first appearance in the show, and I swear to Christ, 90% of the episodes he appears in are hot fucking garbage. For once, I actually think the agony Squidward suffers through is extremely undeserved. And wow, what a shock. I don't find the idea of a character being frozen in cement while they continuously cry and beg for their life to be an enjoyable way to spend 11 minutes of my time. If I was forced to pinpoint one reason as to why this one makes me upchuck my lunch, it'd be that last thing. Coming from someone who gets very claustrophobic very easily, this entire concept makes my stomach do backflips. I wouldn't even mind this if anything unique was done with it, like if the episode was approached from a horror angle, but it's just not. The thing is an uncomfortable experience in the worst way possible. A high 1 yeah. out of 10, last yeah. place on my ranking for sure. Even then, I still consider this one better than Dumped because it has two lines of dialogue I like as opposed to just one. SpongeBob may be my personal favorite cartoon of all time, but it is no stranger to terrible episodes. But I don't like Then why did you ask for it? We're magic. Ooh. Magic! Ooh! By the time I'm finished with this entire retrospective, there are going to be so many subcategories for episodes, we're gonna have to make a whole damn list. Introducing episodes that have cool premises, but waste them in the most lame, milk toast, underwhelming way physically possible. We'll come up with a better name later, I promise. The idea of SpongeBob getting his stubby yellow hands on magic is honestly a genius one. It's magic! As in, limitless creativity. You can literally do whatever you want. The sky is quite frankly the limit. So what do they do with this brilliant idea? 6 out of 10, number 30. SpongeBob thinks he turns Squidward into an ice cream cone, and instead of actually focusing on the cool magic stuff, SpongeBob spends the whole episode taking care of this delicious dairy dessert. Talk about a cock tease. Thanks a lot, dickweeds. Hocus Pocus is such a nothing burger episode, which is ironic because it's about ice cream, but that doesn't work nearly as well as a pun, so... <laughs> Admittedly, I'm being a little hyperbolic here, as the episode is fine, the jokes are fine, the plot is okay, the random-ass Wizard of Oz reference is decent. Everything about this one is fine. Fuck! If the premise I described to you earlier sounds right up your alley, then just go watch Trident Trouble from Season 10, an episode that towers over this one. Hocus Pocus certainly doesn't have the magic touch. If anything, it makes me want to disappear like a magic trick. Number 2. Yep. This is another one that's not only in my top 10, but possibly my top 5 favorites of all time. 
Out of every episode in the series, even including my number one favorite, Driven to Tears is the one that resonates with me the most, personally, as it delves into a topic that has loomed over my mind for my entire life. Jealousy. I'm not exactly saying that this episode is deep or complex, because really, it's not. But, it is one that sticks to me like super glue. This premise explores the idea of what would happen if Patrick got the one thing that Spongebob has always wanted. His driver's license. And that answer is... not pretty. Spongebob becomes extremely jealous of his best friend, to the point where he not only wants to not hang out with Patrick anymore, but he acts outright bitter and resentful towards him. And Patrick's smug attitude isn't helping either, to be fair. He basically treats Spongebob like a pedestrian. Though, I'm not gonna knock that against the episode, since 1. Patrick is so swept up in the world of driving that he probably doesn't even notice what he's saying, and 2. He makes it up to Spongebob by the end. Driven to Tears showcases what can happen to even the best of friendships once the demon that is jealousy takes over. It warps your mind, destroys any rational thought, and can absolutely ruin your relationships with people. But you just can't help being jealous, it's just how you feel. Having some of my real-life experiences be mirrored almost one-to-one -one with my favorite cartoon character of all time as a therapy session I didn't know I was going to have. To be fair, I'm being slightly overdramatic here. Driven to Tears has a lot of stellar jokes. What a genius make an illegal U-turn through an orphanage! They ran for it in time. And an ending that's so sweet it gives me cavities. So it's a very similar situation to Patrick Smartpants. An episode having all the hallmarks of a truly great SpongeBob experience while having a tiny bit more substance to chew on. Patrick Smartpants is still number one because of how emotionally impactful it is, but Driven to Tears is not far behind at all. Rule of Dumb and Driven to Tears are pretty much two sides of the same coin, and I mean that in basically every single way possible. I mean, hell, both episodes are literally paired together. But both of them pretty much do the exact same thing as far as concepts go. Patrick is suddenly thrust into some kind of position of power, whether it be socially or literally. And due to the power getting to his head, he acts like a cunt because of it. This one is at least a step above episodes like Grandma's Kisses and I'm With Stupid though, because at least he realizes he was acting like a jerk. Still, the story here is very bare bones and nothing. It's a 5 out of 10, number 33 on my list for sure. As of writing this, I'm currently in the middle of rewatching Rocco's Modern Life, which has not only been a blast, but has provided me with an episode that is this one, but better in every way. In uniform behavior, the show's resident stupid character, Heifer, lets the power go to his weirdly shaped head after he becomes the nighttime security guard for Conglamo, where he has to watch the monitors overnight. So, Five okay, Nights at Fred. Uniform behavior works because it has more substance than just Heifer acts like a jerk as it focuses more on the horror-esque atmosphere of the situation. Thank you to my rewatch of Rocco for lining up weirdly well with my writing for this review. So yeah, I have no reason to ever watch Rule of Dumb ever again, even if Patrick canonically has gay relatives. And also this reaction clip. Yeah, well, now you can spend the rest of your life crying about it! <laughs> Sometimes cartoon episodes just don't care about having a story. Literally all they care about sometimes is just being funny. Everyone's a comedian, am I right? Case in point, Born to be Wild has a practically non-existent story. SpongeBob and Patrick find out that a supposed vicious biker gang is heading towards Bikini Bottom. So they spend the whole episode panicking and screaming with their big gapers, and that's basically it. The biker gang doesn't even show up until the very last scene. And there's a stupid ass twist where they aren't even threatening at all. Because of course that's the twist! The plot for this one is about as thin as a used condom. I could understand why people would not like this one. Yet, I have to give it a 9 out of 10 
and put it at number 16 on my ranking. It's just so good at being funny. I seriously don't care that the plot isn't even special because the jokes just hit so fast and so hard. I gotta warn everybody! I'd better take the shortcut. Mr. Krabs! SpongeBob! Like, what? How do you even come up with that? It's brilliant! I don't even like motorcycles! I have a burning hatred for them, in fact. They suck! I mean, bikers as a concept are badass, I'll admit, but still. Even then, the South Park episode where they make fun of bikers is still better than this one. Though, I can't play a clip from it, because if I did, I'm sure this video would get taken down. I like Born to be Wild a lot, despite its problems. It's also the only episode ever where Spongebob drinks blood! Psychopath. And why he orple. Seriously though, there's this long running animation error in season 4 where in some copies of certain episodes, Plankton's mouth is sometimes purple, and I find that mildly humorous. It took four seasons, but we finally have the hero and villain team up episode even though Mr. Krabs' morality is questionable at best. Best Frenemies isn't the greatest example of this I've ever seen, as I think a lot of the appeal of this plot type is seeing these two opposing forces try to overcome an even bigger threat. That way, the unexpected team-up is justified in its existence. And the Kelp Shake store is just a regular fucking store. They serve no physical threat to Krabs and Plankton, and the company doesn't even know they exist. So what stakes are there? By the time that something big and threatening actually does happen, the episode just concludes. This is why the Krusty Bucket is better, by the way, but we'll cross that bridge when we burn it. Season 4, episode 18b is carried HARD by how good Krabs and Plankton's interactions are, though. It's fun to see whatever harebrained scheme they'll come up with next. Oh, hair! Clever! Seven kelp shakes out of ten. Number 28 on the list. Not if you can help it! <laughs> Hear it! <laughs> this tastes like just Let me try that. <laughs> this tastes like a wet dick. Let me try that. Hey! You're hey! <laughs> Bruh, okay, I guess season 4 is just the season of fantastic episodes that focus on Spongebob and Patrick's friendship. You could make an entire trilogy out of these, each with their own different themes about the complexities of friendship. Patrick Smart Pants was about maturity, Driven to Tears was about jealousy, and The Pink Purloiner is about mistrust. No matter how long you've known someone for, you will never really truly know them, if you know what I mean. This episode explores the paranoia of that and how it can lead people to do terrible things to their friends, even if there was no ill intentions at all. I think it was a really smart idea to make Patrick completely innocent here. Him making a new jellyfishing net for Spongebob after his old one went missing shows that he really cares about him, despite what other episodes would lead you to believe. Though this is a kid's cartoon, keep in mind, so despite my insane rambling, the themes of these episodes aren't exactly subtle. Though this isn't a preschool show either, so the morals aren't spoon-fed to the audience. It's like a perfect in-between. This is an easy 10 out of 10, going to number 11 on my ranking. I've noticed that a lot of episodes in Season 4 have really strong emotional storytelling. While most of the time when a lot of pre-movie episodes tried to do this, they fell flat on their faces. I'm going to chalk this up to three reasons. One, while these episodes put story at the forefront, they don't go overboard with the melodrama. Two, they don't have stupid fucking asshole twists at the end that completely ruin an episode's hook. And three, these season four episodes actually remember to tell jokes. Word on the street is that you know where to get quality jellyfishing supplies. What street said that? Was it this one? Mind your own business! The only time in pre-movie where an episode was completely emotionally sincere from beginning to end was Christmas Who. But I guess the Pink Purloiner can't be considered good, right? It's from season four, and only the first three seasons are good. Shut the hell up, oh my god. Well, how about that? This segment comes with no strings attached. All I remember Squidward for is the YouTube poop of it. Play a clip. 
You mean you're here to sign me for a bagel? The answer to that question is a big dinner. This little fella, on the other hand, is woo hoo woo hoo awful. We're offering him a four dollar contract and a spaghetti soup. This YouTube poop is a thousand times more entertaining than the episode itself, by the way. All the way back in season one, which feels like an ancient review at this point, I mentioned a specific joke structure I really don't like most of the time, that the episode Culture Shock did extremely well. That joke structure being, one guy does a thing and gets shit for it, but another guy does the exact same thing and gets praised for it. Guess what Squidward does? It works in Culture Shock because the punchline is reserved for the ending gag of the whole episode. It's pretty much the third act climax. In Squidward, it's only used to show that everyone in Bikini Bottom are massive pricks. Newsflash, we already know this. If you wanted to make an episode about puppets, why not go all out and make an entire episode about puppeteering? Get the Jim Henson Company to make Muppet-style puppets for all the characters. I promise it'll be super unique and fun. Teen Titans Go of all cartoons did something similar to this. Hell, even the Spongebob YouTube channel does cool stuff like this all the time. What's your excuse? 4 out of 10, number 34 on my list. I may be made out of wood right now, but even I can see that this one is lame. One of the only unironically funny moments here is the last instance in this season of Squidward twerking. I swear to god, everyone in Bikini Bottom has absolute thunder cheeks, and that's going to make horny people very happy. Ugh, best day ever! I may despise episodes like Grandma's Kisses, Dumped, and The Thing, but I did not have enough energy to dedicate an entire review to getting angry at those. At worst, I either got depressingly monotone or moderately annoyed, but best day ever? Fuck! Out of every episode in the franchise so far, this one pisses me off the most. If you don't know, Best Day Ever was at the forefront of a marketing campaign Nickelodeon did back in 2006, where they aired nothing but Spongebob for 24 hours, while counting down the top 100 episodes of the series up to that point. Which fans got to vote on? Guess what? It was rigged! Most of these episodes towards the top of the list were Season 4 episodes only because it was the currently airing season! New Leaf was in the top 10. I don't think many people like New Leaf. It was a cheap marketing stunt in every sense of the word. But surely, the main episode being advertised in this ratings track was at least gonna be good, right? Right? No! Of course not! Best Day Ever is one of the most boring and predictable episodes in the entire fucking franchise. SpongeBob wants to have the best day ever with all of his friends. But Raggy, everything goes wrong at every turn. Whoa! It's just SpongeBob wanting to hang out with one of his friends. Some unexpected thing goes wrong. Repeat until 11 precious minutes of my life are gone. This wouldn't even be a point of contention if there were funnies. But there's not! Where's the funny? Also, why is everyone cheering at Squidward's clarinet concert? Isn't he supposed to be god-awful at the clarinet? Hello? And I'm just gonna say it, I hate the Best Day Ever song. It was originally a song that Tom Kenny wrote for the end of the credits of the first Spongebob movie. But it is so goddamn ear-grating and repetitive. It is by far my least favorite song the show has ever made. I can't believe this is coming from the same franchise that has the fun song, Loop De Loop, Underwater Sun, Feeling of Greed, Down the Well, and even some bangers from seasons I haven't talked about yet like Musical Doodle, Who Am I, and My Leg Is In Love. I know some people really love this song and that's fine, but it is nails on a chalkboard for me. Best Day Ever is a 2 out of 10, number 37 on the ranking. It's at least neat that we got two new writers out of this. Nate Cash and Tuck Tucker, rest in peace. But this was not a good first impression, and they have definitely written better episodes than this later on. Is it really the best day ever, though? Is it? <sighs> Ha <laughs> ha
Well, I've exhausted all of my energy in the previous review, so let's make the season 4 finale an easy and breezy one. It's good! I give it a 7 out of 10, and I place it at number 27 on the list. Nothing to write home about, but for what it is, it's cute! Sure, the gift of gum embraces gross-out humor more than most Spongebob episodes do, but it didn't really bug me that much here. Hell, some of the gags, like an entire group of people who have been stuck in the gum for presumably years, and the gum spreading everywhere are pretty fun ones. And of course, being a femboy, I really like the color pink. It's my second favorite color right behind green. It's another season finale that's just kind of decent and doesn't really reflect the quality of the season it's from, but I'm glad season 4 was able to snag one more good episode before it took its final bow. This season definitely deserves it. Next time, this retrospective somehow gets even more interesting. And that, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, is our first step into the post-movie era. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun working on the Season 4 video. It is currently about 9.15 in the morning as I record this, and I don't really feel the need to summarize my uh, thoughts on Season 4. I feel as though I did a pretty good job talking about Season 4 in this video, uh, but there are a few things I want to mention really quick. Uh, firstly, this is the uh, first video, uh, and hopefully not the last, in which I had a friend of mine edit a segment for me. If you noticed the Patrick Smartpants segment was different looking, that's because uh, my friend TTLF uh, edited that segment for me. Uh, he wished to remain uncredited in the actual segment itself, but told me that it was okay to credit him at the very end of the video, so he did phenomenal work on it. I am super happy with how it came out, and I'm super thankful to him for taking the time out of his day to even consider editing it for me. Uh, also, something else I want to mention about Season 4 specifically, which I think is really interesting. I noted in the video how Season 4 has a lot more emotional storytelling than any other season. And apparently, this was very much intentional, like I thought it was. Uh, recently, the Spongebob community, in some kind of Discord server, had an interview with Paul Tibbet, who, reminder, is the showrunner for the post-movie era. And someone asked him about this, and he said that yes, uh, Season 4 having more emotional storytelling was definitely intentional, and I'm pretty sure his reasoning was that, you know, they were kind of doing the same things with the characters for the first three seasons, but if the show were to continue onward for, you know, god knows how long at this point, um, they wanted to expand the characters' bubbles a little bit and kind of make them feel a wider range of emotions, which I really like that. That's really cool. It's kind of weird how Season 4 is the only season that they do this for. Season 5 onwards never really attempted anything like this ever again, but, you know, I guess that just makes Season 4 all the more special. Um, speaking of which, uh, after this video goes up, which will hopefully be this weekend as of recording this, um, I am taking a break from making these. Um, I made the first four videos uh, for the first four seasons, basically back to back to back. Like, like as soon as uh, one video was uploaded, I would immediately start writing the script for the next one. And I, j I can't do that this time, guys. I'm sorry. I am burnt the fuck out. Um, even like during like the end of the season four video, when I was like editing editing the endings and stuff and the last few segments, I was just ready to be done. Um, I'm in college right now. I've been, I've been in college since last year, and I'm gonna be way busier the next couple months, so I hope you guys understand. But don't worry, I will be back to make the Season 5 video. I wanna say, and don't quote me on this, but I wanna say I'll, uh, start writing the script for the Season 5 video maybe sometime in March, and maybe have it out by April? 
Don't quote me on that, things could change, but you know how life is. As one of my friends likes to say, shit happens, sometimes literally. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was the season four retrospective. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure as hell enjoyed it. Thanks to everyone who uh, made this possible. Thanks to my fucking artist, man. He was a real one. Uh, Roy, not only did he make a banger thumbnail for this video, he animated both a new intro and outro for me. What a lad. Incredible. I, I'm i super thankful to him. Uh, go follow him on social media, uh, wherever you can. He makes fantastic art. Uh, such a swell guy. Um, and one last thing I will say, um, out of the first five seasons, season five is definitely my least favorite of the first five seasons so far, so the season five retrospective is going to be very, very interessante. Stay tuned for that. <laughs>